Good afternoon. My name is Tupper, uh, Tupper Garden. I'm the interim pastor at Salem Presbyterian Church, and I'm glad that you're joining us today. This is Wednesday, the 27th of um, January, 2021. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we're making our way through the gospel according to St. John, and uh, hoping that uh, you're having a good time with this study and that you're learning something and that it is uh, of benefit to you. I enjoy it, and I, um, I hope that you do as well. And I hope that it is not only something that you enjoy, but that you find uh, to be edifying, that is, upbuilding for you in your uh, Christian walk. Uh, I believe we ended up last uh, week, we were talking about the woman at the well, the fourth chapter of uh, Gospel of John, uh, when the woman at the well says, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. Messiah and Christ mean the same thing, two different languages. Christ is Greek, Messiah is um, Hebrew meaning the one who is anointed or the anointed one. Uh, when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us, said the Samaritan woman. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. So this, uh, Jesus says flat out, right out, that he's the Messiah, the one for whom the Jews are looking for and the one for whom the Samaritans are looking. Uh, and then we'll begin... With the 27th verse, let us pray. Lord, may your spirit attend us. May your word be open to us. May our hearts be open to receive it. And in receiving your word, may it take root and grow and bear much fruit. Amen. <clears throat> Just then... Jesus' disciples came, verse 27. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. We talked about that last week, but no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. So what's going on there? There's a, you know, John's a great, a great text for preaching. Just the great, I mean, over and over, wonderful text for preaching. She left her water jar. In other words, what she came to do when she came to the well where she met Jesus, she came to get water. And after having me, met Jesus, taking the water didn't seem to mean much. She left her water jar. Either she forgot her water jar because she was so excited about what Jesus had told her and so excited about her encounter with Jesus, or she didn't forget her water jar. Her water jar just didn't seem as important anymore. Okay? Now, if that's not a preaching text, I don't know what is. And when you and I think about the water jars of our lives, the seemingly important things that so consume our days and how if we encounter Christ, um, they don't seem so important anymore. When life changes, and the encounter with Christ doesn't necessarily mean a vision or a time of prayer or a meditation on the scripture, it can mean any time that we're confronted with the mystery of life and the mystery of God in life um, is an encounter, I think, with Christ. It points to Christ. When we get that diagnosis or when uh, someone we love gets that diagnosis or when the ashes are put on our foreheads or 
uh, at a Nash Wednesday service or anything, uh, the birth of a child, uh, all sorts of things confront us with the mystery of our life and its um, importance and humbles us and makes us rethink why we were so while we were so engaged in that other stuff, it doesn't seem so important now. Do you remember, if you were fortunate enough to have had this experience, do you remember when you first fell in love and how um, nothing else seemed to matter? That's the woman at the well. She left her water jar and went back to the city. Well, I've never preached on that text, but it seems like it might be a good one, don't you? I, I really like that. Uh, and she said to the people back at the city where in Samaria where she lived, um, uh, come and see a man who told me everything that I have ever done. So I remember he told her that um, she wasn't married. The man she was married to wasn't her husband. The, one, the man that she was living with wasn't her husband and that she had had three husbands prior and uh, and he had just met her. So he knew about her before she had met him. And uh, he, and he, so she's obviously is struck by that, that, she, that uh, Jesus n seems to know her even though he has never, in her experience, has never met her. Uh, reminds one of uh, Jesus when he met Nathaniel uh, in, in another gospel. And her response to that is, remember, he has just told her that he's the Messiah. Uh, he says, he cannot be the Messiah, can he? Now, there's another text to preach on, isn't it? Uh, He's told her that he's the Messiah, but of course she doubts, and she brings this personal experience and evidence uh, and arg is arguing with herself and others and trying to imagine that she really has met the one that they've been looking for. And don't we all do that? We wonder if the one that we have met in Christ is what we think he is. Can we trust him with our lives, ourselves? Can we trust him with tomorrow? He can't be what he says, can he? Ah, that's another sermon right there. Uh, and they left the city and were on their way to him. So they all, all the people that she's talking to, they all say, well, let's go see him. So they take off. In the meantime, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. Why? Because evidently he hadn't had anything to eat all day. And they're worried about him, and they're thinking that maybe he's uh, not taking care of himself. And here we go with John again. John puts these words in Jesus' mouth. Maybe he's reporting them. I don't know. But at any rate, John puts these words reports these words of Jesus, uh, and, and, and he uses these images, these metaphors of deep meaning, deep meaning. Um, he said to them, they've asked him to get something to eat, I have food to eat that you don't know about. Now, in the former chapter, the one that, the former encounter that we've just been talking about, Remember, Jesus talks to her, to the woman at the well, about water. If you knew who I was, you would ask me for, you'd be asking me for a drink of the water that I have to give you, which is living water. And she doesn't understand, right? She doesn't understand that he's talking about the life of God, the Spirit of God, the uh, eternal life that Jesus has come to bring that wells up in the in those who trust it and in the believer. And now he says to the disciples, I have food to eat that you don't know about. 
And so the disciples say to one another, just as in every encounter that we will see in John, people who, in, who encounter Jesus don't understand what he's talking about when he uses this metaphorical language. But we do because we're reading John and reading back on it, you see. And so the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. They don't understand what he's saying. And Jesus says to them, he tells them then. He explains to them what it is that he means by this food that they don't know about. And he says, my food, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. In other words, my sustenance, what I live on and what, I, what, what drives me, what gives me the energy to go forward is not um, uh, 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 chicken and rice. It's not uh, uh, falafel and pita. And it's not hummus. And it's not uh, 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 stewed goat meat. What is it that that is his food? And his food is to do the will of him who sent me. Now, here's an interesting thing in the Gospel of John. No other gospel, no other gospel like the Gospel of John emphasizes the divinity of Jesus like the Gospel of John does. Um the woman, he knows, he, the, Jesus' special understanding and knowledge of the woman's life before he's met her. This divine uh, understanding that he has of other people and their lives is a, a sign of his divinity. Um, and yet, no other gospel makes the distinction between Jesus and the Father as, dis as, as clearly as the Gospel of John. I want you to note that as you go forward reading John. Note that, there's, that Jesus is always referring to the otherness of God. He says, the Father and I are one. In John, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He says that in John. But he also says stuff like this, like our text for this, uh, like the, the verse we just read. My food, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. He's talking about the Father from whom he came. That the word became flesh, the Father's word, God's self-expression became flesh. John 1, always go back to the prologue, the one who sent me, who sent the light, who sent the word that became flesh. That's the one that Jesus came to honor and to serve, right? So my food, my sustenance, my purpose, the thing that keeps me going, the thing that drives me forward is to do the will of the one who sent me. And to what? complete his work. Now, to complete his work means, I have no doubt, in the Gospel of John, to give himself away. To be that revealing of the love of God that comes preeminently at his crucifixion. We'll get there one day, God willing. At this rate, it'll probably be this time next year. Uh, but his sustenance, what gives him his life is a, it, what is a requirement for him, as food is a requirement for you and me, is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Now we could stop there and say, well, that's Jesus. Isn't that fine? But, did you, but have, you ever, have you thought about maybe that ought to be our food, uh, at least at least occasionally, we ought to feel like that the purpose of our life, the meaning of our life, what drives us forward, what keeps us going, is to do the will of God who sent us 
and to complete his work. Uh, that that ought to be the church's life. Uh, not necessarily making budget, not necessarily. It's not that we. It's not that there isn't more to life than our Christian life, but than our overtly missional Christian life. But you see, all of our life, as all of our life, um, has something to do with the food and the sustenance, the daily bread of our lives. Um, uh, as that is part of who we are and part and parcel of who we are, so doing the will of the Father ought to be part and parcel of the life that we lead. And that's not just something for preachers. I can tell you that maybe preachers think about it more because we have to preach every week and teach classes like this. And um, I can tell you that I feel like quite a hypocrite when I jump up on a text like this because... You know, I, I sometimes think of doing a, a Bible study like this as a, you know, a, a, an obstacle, a job I have to complete today. It's on my list. I Right here, I've got a list, a to-do list every day. And the Bible study is on that to-do list. And, and it, it's just something that I have to do. It's not something that pulls me forward sometimes. Sometimes writing a sermon or delivering a sermon is can be just a job. Sometimes coming to work at the church can be just a job and lose sight of the fact that our that what we're doing here is to do the will of the Father and to complete his work. And what is his work? That we should be the light of the world. As Jesus was the light of the world, that we should be the light of the world. As God, the Word became flesh in Jesus, in the bodily person of Jesus, so we're to be the body of Christ. We're to be as the, the physical body of Christ, the physical body of Christ, Christ Jesus the man, is not among us since the ascension, but behind is left the Holy Spirit in the church, who is to be the physical presence of Christ on earth to do his will, to do his will and to complete his work. That's what you and I are here to do. And as we've said so often, when we look to Jesus, we see the character and nature of God revealed. And when we look to Jesus, we see the character and nature of God's intention for us revealed. And so, God's intention and character intended for us is that our food, our sustenance, the driving force for us, as God intends it, is that we should do his will. As God intends it, is that we should complete his work. And that's not onerous. That's not to make us feel guilty. That's to say that, that right in front of us is this joyous, life-giving opportunity, right in front of me, right in front of you, that we should be part of something so much larger and grander and glorious than ourselves, than what we usually live for. And uh, like the woman at the well, we might become self-forgetful and that we might leave our water jar and and go and and complete the work and be the word and be the light to other people uh, in the simplest of ways, you know, loving God and loving our neighbor. Um, so that's enough. It's enough. That's enough for right now. Um, then Jesus tells us sort of a little parable here, a rhetorical, there's a, there's a little rhetorical uh, uh, question that he, that he asks here. He says, um, do you not say four months more and then comes the harvest? So for us, you know, we're, we're looking out there at the garden and it's uh, July and we're looking at the garden and it's looking good because it's not gotten that late summer look to it, you know. And we look out there at the garden and the corn is, uh, you know, belt high and the, um, and the 
tomatoes are still haven't gotten the blight and they're looking pretty good and there's little fruit and and you look at it and you say four months in four months in October uh, uh, or rather June in October uh, it'll be harvest time <clears throat> do you not say four months more and then comes the harvest but I tell you look around you look around you right now not not four months from now look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting What's he talking about? He's talking about being those people who, whose food is to do the will of the Father and to complete his work. There are people out. The, the, the fields that are ripe for the harvest are the people. The people all around us that need the light, that need the life, that need the word, that need your love, that need your compassion, that need your um, attention, that need your presence. Look around and see how the fields are ripe for the harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labor and you have entered into their labor. Now, is Jesus talking about the Old Testament here, or is he, or is John looking back from the for the church that John uh, that to whom John addresses this gospel, saying that the work that Jesus has done for us is um, and the seeds that he has planted, we we reap. Uh, I don't know, but it, it, whatever he means here, uh, whatever Jesus is saying here, whatever John is saying through Jesus, is that. All of us find ourselves, it's not up to us to bring the kingdom in. God has been working on bringing the kingdom in forever and ever. God's purposes and people have been part of that purpose. It's not, we should never feel like, oh, we've done a, such a great job. No, our job is simply to do what is before us and to um, <coughs> find our food in doing his will and in um, uh, completing his work. And the completing of the work is the harvesting of the fruit. And the harvesting of the fruit is bringing people to a knowledge of the love of God in Christ. Okay? All right? Many Samaritans from that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. Now, so you see we have a Again, in John, we have an encounter, the woman in the well. We have her misunderstanding. We have an elucidation by John of what Jesus means. The, then there's the interjection of the disciples and the food that Jesus has to eat. And then Jesus talks about, you know, the fields are ripe for harvest and all that. And then there's an example. Do you see? See how this works? It, I mean, John's a good writer. Then there's an example. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him. Now, belief means they trusted in him. They were excited about him. They followed him because of the woman's testimony. Because she, you know, if, you get, if, if you're called to go into a courtroom and testify, you're, you're a witness, you're not supposed to, you, so you put your hand on the Bible and say, you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God to do. We're not supposed to talk about what we wish were true. We're not supposed to, you know, our job is not to tell other people how great Christ is and how full our life is when the fact of the matter is that we're struggling. Our job is simply to tell others by who we are and what we say to them that we have found, though we struggle, whatever it is that we have found. And the Samaritan woman told these people that of, of what Jesus had said to her and said, he can't be the Messiah, can he? She expressed her doubts when she told him them about it, and yet they came because of her witness. She, wasn't, she didn't have to be carrying around a big black book and, 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 and bang on it. She didn't go around... Uh, given people pamphlets, she simply told them about what Christ, her encounter with Christ was like. 
And that's really all we have to do too. Witness. Tell people by what we are and what we say that we have found whatever it is you have found. A glimmer of hope. An overwhelming light of hope. Um, uh, salvation or uh, the hope of salvation. What is it that you have found? Well, you need to talk about it. Friendship, fellowship, um, uh, a life that uh, that you struggle uh, to find meaning in, but you think it's that the meaning might be right here. That's what that's what you have to share. You see, and and so they believed because he because she said he told me everything I had ever done. Verse thirty nine. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and you know he's not supposed to do that. Remember, and he did. And he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. So Jesus talked to them and taught them, and many more believed. And um, they said to the woman, here, here's, here's, a great, here's a great text, isn't it, for another sermon? They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. So we begin by hearing the report of someone else. All of us begin in our Christian life by hearing the report of someone else. It might be a preacher, but more likely it's a friend, a parent, a grandparent, uh, a neighbor, a teacher, somebody with, in, 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 with whom we have a relationship, a deep relationship, who was willing to express to us the truth that they had found in Christ, the life that they had found in Christ. They might not have put it that way. They might have even put it in, a, in, 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 a, in such a way that the Samaritan woman did. You know, I don't understand this guy, but he knows, but he knew who I was. Uh, and, 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 it, and it could be something obtuse, but, we, but something pricks our interest and we begin to believe just a little bit. And, 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 and when we're young and when we first start out, we, we follow on the basis of what we've heard or the personality of somebody that has drawn us along. Maybe there's a boyfriend or a girlfriend that drug us to church with them, whatever it was. And we started out there, but as we stayed there and as we, and, and, and as we abide in this struggle and quest for faith and as we sit at the feet of Jesus like the Samaritans did for two days as we hear him and think on him and study the the scriptures suddenly we come to find out that it's not because of what this person said that's what started it but that now we've come to believe ourselves and the church is one of the church's great missions is to be that person, those persons that start that conversation. That's where evangelism starts. It is person to person, I'm going to tell you what he did, and then try to get them, try to get them into the fellowship of the church, try to get them interested in sitting at the feet of Jesus, studying, helping, praying, and then finally they come to find out for themselves what the faith is really all about. We have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. We've come to realize that he is the Messiah, as you, as he told you, and as you wondered yourself. And when the two days were over, he went from that place back to Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in a prophet's own country. So he went back to Galilee where he was not expecting to be fully understood. And when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him since they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the festival, for they too have gone to the festival. And then again, and then he came again to Cana in Galilee where he had changed the water into wine. Um, it's in another little encounter now. Uh, He's going to meet. He's going to meet uh, an official, a royal official. 
We don't know what kind of royal official it, that is, but it, one would assume that, um, that it was a Roman official. Um, and there was a royal official whose son lay ill in Capernaum. Um, it's, and when he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son. So the word had gotten out to this Roman official that this guy Jesus was around and that he was doing good works and healing and miraculous things, although we haven't heard about it in the Gospel of John particularly. Water turns into wine, okay. But now this is a healing. This is, my son is deathly ill. He went and begged him to come down and heal his son for his son was at the point of death. I don't know how many of you are fathers or mothers, but you know what that must be like. And Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So he was talking about Gentile Roman Christians, but, but uh, Roman Gentiles, but he's talking about everybody. So many of us expect to see a sign, a miracle, before we will trust and the official said to him, Sir, come down before my little boy dies. He's adamant. He's insistent. And Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. And the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. So you see now, this is what John's telling us. It's not because of a sign or a wonder. It's because you believe the word. And so Jesus tells him, Your son will live. And the, and the Roman official believes that word, trusts that word. How much did he trust it? Did he trust it 100%, 90%, 50%, 20%, 5%? Who knows? Who knows? It, and, and, and those sorts of things are immeasurable anyway, aren't they? But he trusted it enough to act on it. And that's the point, see? So the man believed so the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started on his way. See, he, he believed enough to act on it, to act as though it were true. And that's all Christ wants for any of us. That's all God wants for any of us. God does not want us to be certain. We're never going to be certain in this life. We're to be trusting enough to act. That's what faith is. Faith is not knowledge. Faith is trust. You never know. You can only trust. And as he was going down, his slaves met him and told him that his child was alive. And so he asked them the hour when he had began to recover. And they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. And so he thinks about that. Father realized that this was the hour that Jesus said to him, your son will live. So he himself believed along with his whole household. So there was a sign and a wonder, right? There was a sign and a wonder. But that sign and that wonder was based on the man's belief, his trust in the word of Jesus. And so it is for us. We might not ever see signs and wonders like this one. But we're going to see signs and wonders every day as we trust. Maybe not, you know, huge things. Our dying child is made alive. But other things, enough. We're going to see enough if we'll just believe and act. This was the second sign that Jesus did after coming from Judea to Galilee. The first sign was the water into wine. So this is the second sign. Enough. It's time for us to quit. Um, may God bless you and believe in the word of Jesus. Trust in that word enough to act. Trust in that word enough to act in the way that God leads you to act. Love God. Love your neighbor. May the Lord bless you. Bye-bye.